Ever since I was ordained back on June the 5th of 2004, I decided my continuing education as a priest would fall into the two areas I was most fond of, and that is scripture and liturgy. And when you think about it, scripture and liturgy really meet right in the readings that the church chooses for us every Sunday and every weekday. You know, what they tell us through the word of God is then very, very important. Uh, in fact, uh, I have a student in my Did You Know That class who actually has a question in for next month, like how did the lectionary develop over time, that kind of a thing. Now, I don't know whether or not it's dawned on you. Uh, I know it only dawned on me a few years ago. But every first Sunday of Lent, we hear the same story, albeit from a different source. Matthew, this year Mark, next year Luke. And that's the story of what happened after Jesus' baptism when he's driven into the desert and undergoes temptation from the devil. We hear that every first Sunday of Lent. And the second Sunday of Lent, we hear the same story. We call it the transfiguration story, albeit from a different perspective, Matthew, this year Mark, next year Luke. So these stories must be very, very important. And of course, the transfiguration story is an attempt by Jesus to give the uh, three inner circle disciples, Peter, James, and John, a kind of a spiritual B12 shot to prepare them for coming Good Friday. In fact, there's a legend that says that the actual event of the transfiguration took place about 40 days before Good Friday. But based upon their activities and how they acted on Good Friday, I suspect that B12 shot didn't last by the time they got down the mountain. It's kind of like the uh, steroid shots I've been given for my bad back. They don't last very long anyway. Now, when it comes to the transfiguration story, we actually hear it twice a year because there's a fixed date that's the feast of the transfiguration, and that's August the 6th. So you know this story in and out. In fact, you may know the story even better than I know it. So I was thinking in preparing this homily, how could I come up with a new slant to this story that maybe you'd never heard of before, and also how the story could uh, affect us in the 21st century. So here goes. In my research, I've read where a lot of modern-day biblical commentators like to point out that maybe the name of the story is not the best name for it. And it's actually a theophany story. Theophany, two, from two Greek words, theos, God, phonos, sound. It's how God made his appearance. Now, when we think of theophanies, where God makes his appearance, we often think of the book of Exodus, don't we? We think of Moses going up on the mountain to receive the Ten Commandments, that kind of a thing. But there are four elements, scholars say, to every theophany story where God manifests his presence. The first element is it takes place on a mountain. In Exodus, it's Mount Sinai, right? In the Transfiguration, it's Mount Tabor. There are always witnesses, element two, to this. The Hebrew people that had come out of slavery in Egypt. The three inner circle disciples, Peter, James, and John. And there are always signs with the theophany. Now, in the Old Testament, that meant things like thunder and lightning and earthquakes and clouds and red sky and all this other kinds of thing. In today's story, Jesus turns his face white, right? And his clothes become white. And, and Moses and Elijah appear with him. And the fourth element of the story is a shared experience. Based upon that experience of that theophany of Mount Sinai, the people, the Hebrew people, become God's covenantal people. And with regard to the transfiguration story, Peter, James, and John become some of the foundation stones for the church. So it's a theophany story besides being Jesus himself transfigured. Peter, James, and John saw God, saw Jesus as he really is. Okay, so that's a little bit about the story. How can this story have special meaning to us today other than just being a re 
recording of what happened 2,000 years ago. Well, back in my studies in management years ago, there was a fellow that we used to study called Abraham Maslow. Some of you may recognize his name. He's the father of motivational theory, what really motivates us to do what we want to do. And he developed that so-called hierarchy of needs, okay, that kind of a thing. Well, he also, in one of his writings, developed uh, uh, an idea of what he called a peak moment, a peak moment. And that's when an ordinary event somehow or another becomes extraordinary, where God shines through that event, taking it from being a mere everyday uh, ordinary event into another realm. Example, paint this picture, close your eyes or whatever. It's maybe the first really nice Saturday in spring. The family is having breakfast. Dad and the two little kids are eating their Cheerios, or as you probably know, Cheerios are good things to throw. They may have had a food fight with it. They're enjoying themselves. They're, they're happy. They're, they're doing all kinds of wonderful things. Mom is there spreading butter and jelly on some toast and pouring the orange juice. Sun is coming, rays of sun are coming in. And she looks at this scene and suddenly this ordinary occurrence, like most every other Saturday, suddenly becomes extraordinary for her. She gets this feeling of absolute love and peace about how God has blessed her with this family, with this husband, with these two kids. And here she is in this ordinary event that suddenly has become so extraordinary for her that tears come down her eyes. She's so happy. She's so blessed. She's so loving. She's such at peace. And it's the same event that happens most every Saturday. But suddenly it meant something absolutely extraordinary to her. And that's what Maslow meant by a peak moment. Now these peak moments often don't last very long. It may just be seconds, a few minutes, an hour. Sometimes one's blessed with them continuing a little bit more than that. In my life, I think I've had two such moments. One, in one theology, my mom died. It was in November of 2000. And I had to go back from Boston to Baltimore to bury her. And it was an ordinary thing. I've been at all kinds of funerals over all my life. But something happened. And suddenly, at, something came over me where I felt God's peace and love. And in fact, I felt like it wasn't even in my body anymore. You know, it was such, a, I, I can't even put in the words what happened. And, you know, and nothing extraordinary happened, but it became an extraordinary event for me. And the feeling lasted for two days. I made it back the next day to seminary, and I went to see my spiritual director, and I said, something's going on here, you know. Is this, is this a, a genuine, is this authentic, what's happening? I said, because it suddenly has stopped, and now I'm absolutely depressed. I want that feeling to continue. And he said, I think it is authentic. I think God has given you a special grace, and these things don't continue. Now, saints may have them often, we normal people, we're lucky if it happens once in our life. I had another experience the following year at Creighton University, sort of like that one. It lasted for a while, and it went away too. You see, these peak moments that may come into our lives are like a foretaste of what heaven is like. I mean, that experience I had was so wonderful, and it's happened here to me, of all people, and on earth, 
Just think of that's what's happening all the time. When we enjoy God's love, his presence in our lives, the peace that only Jesus can give. That's kind of a definition of what heaven would be like, isn't it? And these little peak moments that come are like that B12 shot for us to keep our faith going. One or two such things may have to be what sustain us throughout our journey in this life and give us a foretaste of how marvelous, how wonderful heaven must be. You know, in Advent, there's a little prayer uh, that we often use based on a Hebrew word, Maranatha, which means, come Lord quickly. Remember in Advent, we look forward to the second coming of Christ, don't we? We say, come Lord quickly. How about what's developing one for Lent? Based upon today's story, based upon Maslow's idea of a peak moment. Perhaps we should pray this Lent, Lord God, help me to see you face to face, as did Moses, as did Elijah, as did the three disciples, and many others through the course of history, even to this day. Amen. Have you had your peak moment? Will you be ready when it comes along? Will you recognize it? Be ready for it. It's a graced moment.